Salutations, exiles. Wait a second. Salutations, exiles? Salutations, travelers? What do I even say? Anyway, are you coming from PoE and you want to build a familiar, satisfying, and viable build? Perfect, because this is the So You Want to Play series. So you want to play I Shot Dead Eye from Path of Exile, but you also want to try out the hottest new ARPG, Last Epoch, huh? Well, let's see how close we can get to replicating I Shot Dead Eye in Last Epoch. Before we start, let's look really quickly at what an I Shot build plays like in PoE. If you're familiar at all with the game, this shouldn't be anything new to you. We won't be able to perfectly replicate the build, but we can get pretty close. I Shot in PoE is typically a high budget build that has strong clear, high mobility, and it utilizes the freeze mechanic to its fullest. It has so-so single target, however, and low survivability. A lot of that is the same in Last Epoch, but the build can function much better on a budget here, and while you can spec hard into damage, I personally went for a more survivable build which scales really well with the high rate at which we'll be freezing enemies. Let's take a look at how the mechanics of the skills function. I Shot in PoE fires a cold arrow and explodes into a cone. Pretty simple, right? Now let's look at our faux I Shot equivalent in Last Epoch. Okay, it's pretty similar. We fire a cold-based arrow that explodes into a cone on impact. Great. In PoE, often you'll see I Shot and on-hit bow users spec into critical chance, and the same is true in LE. Also, in Path of Exile, you'll often see dexterity stacking affixes, leading players to stacking high amounts of dex, and while it's not required, that's also something we can do in LE. Typically in PoE, you'll have more projectiles, and you'll use Barrage for single target. While we won't be using a barrage setup the exact same way as we would in Path of Exile, it'll still be useful for us in Epoch. Easy. Another key difference between the two builds is that we won't be shooting multiple projectiles like we do in PoE. Pack sizes between the two games are very different, so the single cone we get from our faux eye shot in Last Epoch will be plenty. And if we even wanted to, we can scale its AoE up later. Now let's really dive into the meat of how we're doing this in Last Epoch, a skill called Detonating Arrow. If you play as the Rogue class and pick the Marksman Ascendancy, you'll have a host of bow skills to choose from. Detonating Arrow is no exception. With that specialization, it plays very similarly to Explosive Arrow from PoE, firing an arrow with a payload that explodes after a short delay. The only difference between the two skills at their base is that Detonating Arrow is a lightning skill versus PoE's Fire Damage Explosive Arrow. However, when we look at the skill specialization tree, things get pretty spicy. By taking the Frostfang Arrow Keystone in the lower left section of the tree, we convert our Lightning Damage to Cold. Then, by taking the ironically named Barrage Keystone to the northwest of the tree, we have our explosion be instantaneous instead of on a timer, and we also fire the ability in a cone shape as opposed to a circle. Ta-da! Fake Ice Shot. Throughout this video, I'll be showcasing the build with some stronger gear and uniques, but also a bit of a more modest build tackling some endgame content. I've also tested the build's viability by pushing Arena past 200 waves, which puts me at uh, number 36 on the ladder right now, at least for Rogue. During the run, I opted not to use the incredibly powerful decoy skill as it's a bit cheesy, and instead I wanted to rely on the strength, the detonating arrow, and the freezes alone, and overall I was pretty happy with the results. A 5 skill build should definitely be able to push past wave 210. Let's look at the passive tree. As I mentioned before, the tree and the gear are optimized for survivability instead of simply damage focused, but there's a lot of depth and options to fit a player's personal preference. It's also starter viable, but I should know that certain uniques in the idols might come into the fold a little bit later. Pre-mastery, just go for a traditional flurry or a shuriken max setup, and once you're level 25, you'll be able to master into the marksman tree and things really start to come together. Early on in the tree, I'd go to either the left side or the middle, opting for health or damage as I see fit, player preference. The dexterity from Steady Hand helps our defenses and it boosts damage a little bit, but it becomes even more useful in terms of damage as we pick up our unique deck stacking boots later on. The haste chance and increased damage from agility on the rogue passive tree is nice, but I could see people's reasons for not using it, I suppose. Considering it's one of our only sources of haste here though, even at one second duration, it is a pretty nifty node, and the damage increase it gives is especially useful when you have movement speed buffs. I'm still a fan of glancing blows, even after its nerfs recently, and as a rogue you can attain it pretty easily. So I take dodge and parry, and I also opt for sapping strike since we'll want it for our mana sustain engine when we use detonating arrow. This currently puts me at 32 points on the basic road tree, but you'll want to spec into the marksman tree as soon as possible, so I'd opt for leaving points out of steady hand or swift assassin until later down the line. 
So the choice to spec into Blade Dancer a bit might seem odd to some, but remember I'm gearing this build towards damage and survivability. It does suck taking two passive points into Pursuit and not getting any bonus from the melee damage, but unlocking the Shroud of Dust passive is very nice. I probably wouldn't do this until later though, because with decent equipment you should be fairly survivable early on. Okay, now let's take a look at the Marksman Tree. There are a few debate picks here, and by no means am I saying that this build or my tree are the Bible. I opt for Elemental Arrows and Assassin's Quiver for the damage, and I spec into the movement speed portion of the Concentration Tree specifically for the arena, as I wanted high movement speed to kite efficiently. Siege Quiver is nice and it helps round out my defenses occasionally. Heightened Senses Crit Avoidance is an amazing defensive tool, especially for Arena, and the note also gives us Crit Multiplier, which acts as a more multiplier because we'll be critting so often. I don't spec very heavily into Woundmaker for the Crit Vulnerability for a couple of reasons, which we'll see down the line, but depending on where the build is at, if you need more crit chance, it's a very powerful node to make sure you're getting the most of your damage. I've got one point at Thief's Quiver and it's nice, but that's mostly an afterthought and that's where I'm taking my last few points as I hit level 100, so don't worry about it too much. The big things to note farther up in the tree are one point in Fire and Steel, so we maintain our elemental arrow boosts only for detonating arrow, Sniper's Gambit for a huge flat damage boost at the cost of some survivability, and the max allotted arrow storm passes for a massive surge in damage every 10 seconds. One point into Covering Fire is an excellent defensive option, and I round out the tree with some points in Sharpshooter, two points in Barrage of Pain, one point in Death from Afar, and all of the rest of our maximum allotted points into Perfect Aim. Like I mentioned before, this is only a rough guideline, and as you can see, I played around with what I find comfortable in terms of breakpoints to consistently proc the powerful effects I'm going for. You could totally make the case that Barrage of Pain should have more investment in it, especially if you're missing crit on gear. And the armor shred and stun chance from Death from Afar here, yeah, it's really only meh, useful, but not exactly what the build is going for. Now let's take a look at the skills. I'll go over the utility ones first, and I'll try to keep it simple. Smoke Bomb is a strong defensive tool and a getaway cleanse. I take the backflip node escape tactics because it allows for a quick animation cancel that it seems the regularly thrown smoke bomb doesn't allow for, like so. Compare that to the thrown animation. Besides that, there's a bit of utility here, but you could really take the skill any way you want. Spec for more crit chance by taking Shadow Hunter, for example. You could go for more glancing blow chance by specking further into wrap concealment here, so on and so forth. Initially, I had my shift set up to cleanse ailments, but I didn't like the slight cooldown increase and instead swapped my element cleanse to my smoke bomb. For that reason, I used my shift as movement, obviously, but also a great way to juice up my damage with a ton of jagged jade arrows. Lastly, it provides some amazing utility with its nice 1.5 second movement speed buff for momentum and the incredible rebound node, granting a refund of the cooldown if you take a really meaty hit. It doesn't always proc, but when it does, it is a game changer. My decoy is pretty standard, going for enemy cold resistance shred and some utility. I could see you increasing its duration even more by specking last in presence up higher, but I like where it is as a defensive dummy and something that inflicts strong debuffs to the enemy. Flurry is our barrage-like setup. Ultimately, our damage isn't really coming from Flurry, but we're specking it for as much attack speed as possible and to be our mana generator. In a pinch, it can deal some damage, but in combat, remember that's not the main draw. I'd also advise anyone using the skill to recognize that the mana on hit you gain from the Sap Willpower node in the Rogue Tree, it's not coming from the later hit. So keep in mind that you can cancel the skill early with some quick mechanics, kite more effectively, and still get your mana on hit. Technically, we could make our flurry channel and function nearly identically to Barrage from PoE, but ultimately the playstyle similarity there comes with a cost of reduced viability, so I decided to use it as my engine instead of trying to gear it for max damage. The damage from Detonating Arrow is going to outpace it anyway. Speaking of Detonating Arrow, let's take a look. So nothing super fancy here. I have some body armor with a tier 1 affix that adds a level to Det Arrow, but you could just as easily take it off. The important nodes I mentioned before are Barrage and Frostfang Arrow. They make the build click. Since we're using a skill that can freeze and running freeze multipliers on our gear, we'll be maxing out the freeze multi nodes here on Gift of the Ice. We take the minimum amount of infused discharge to open up that sweet well-crafted node for more damage and AoE on our ice shot cone. While our crit multiplier on detonating arrow and crit chance aren't as high of a bonus as some of the other marksman skills receive, I still take a few points into the weak spot node, not only for the multiplier, but also to give us more crit vulnerability, which we forewent in other aspects of the build. Last thing to mention here is navigator shot. While some of you might be elite gamers and feel you'll never miss a shot, the occasional auto-aim for two points is incredibly useful. 
Plus, you get a bit of chill chance, which, with a conversion, could be pretty useful if you wanted to use the incredibly rare Osharion ring in this build. Alright, so let's take a look at the items now. So first off, the idols. I think the idol system is pretty neat, and having chase items is dope, but I'd like to mention that this build doesn't need these idols to work, it's just really good to have them. All around good stuff, crit chance, elemental damage, and as you can see, I don't even own four of these same idols, uh, with the last idol actually having dodge. Capping resistances, taking more hit points, more attack speed on bow hit, or even increasing your debt arrows AoE are totally valid choices for the idol slot. Onto the items themselves. I'm using a Dreadthorn bow because we really like the crit multi-implicit, and I don't feel the need for more increased damage that I could get from an Osprex bow. I also got really lucky with this base. I mean, who could say no to tier 7 attack speed and max roll? Oh man. The bow is amazing, but flat damage affix bows are awesome too if you aren't running a deck stacking build. The actual math on what's perfectly optimal is tough to calculate right now, but in general, flat added damage is an amazing stat to have on weapons in Last Epoch. However, in my specific bow's case, since we already got a good chunk of flat added damage from our total dexterity, the fact that my bow dropped with a crit multi prefix was totally fine with me. I'm also showing some footage with this more modest bow in the vid, so yeah, tier 7 item, not needed for the build to function. Besides that, most of the stuff is pretty standard or low budget. I keep it simple and I'm playing with items that I obtain. So if you're getting into the end game level 70 plus territory, all of this should be fairly achievable. More bonus decks is great for added flat damage, or you could go for a vitality as a, another valid prefix for some more beef. I'm trying to apply as much freeze as possible, but instead of opting for that, you could also just go for more damage in the form of increased damage or critical multiplier. Totally fine. The big things to note here are the uniques, Charaka's Teeth and Morning Frost. The Tooth Quiver is a very strong damage buff, even if we aren't using Puncture or abusing Bleed and Frostbite. I have a pretty well rolled one which I'm pumped about, and if we compare it to a Farwood or Svalnir Quiver here, you can see the damage difference. Keep in mind in actual combat with all of our buffs up, the Svalnir Quiver will be pumping out slightly higher numbers due to the higher crit chance and the implicit crit multiplier, but in my experience it still didn't beat a high rolled unique quiver in the end. The Morning Frost will determine the direction of the build. If you want to go full PoE tryhard deck stacking ranger eye shot, then it's great and you'll see in my build it is the route I decided to go for, but even then I could be getting much more dexterity for more damage. As I mentioned before, sources of flat damage are pretty rare and very strong in last epoch, so having all of that flat is awesome, but it does come with the trade-off in terms of balancing reses. And as you can see, my reses still need a bit of work. I've even got a ridiculous blessing from reses, but some of them are capped, and some are just too overcapped to be considered optimal. If you wanted to use different base items, by the way, totally works. I'm just a fan of capping my poison res, or at least trying to, even if it's considered the least important resistance in the current Ellie meta, but yeah. Weathered coins instead of the ancient coins for armor shred could technically work, different rings or amulets could cover our defenses alternatively, and engraved gauntlets would give us some more value out of endurance. All of those are fine choices. And while I've made this guide for you guys to refer to, I'd like to remind everyone that part of the fun from ARPGs is coming up with your own solutions and builds to unique problems. That just about does it. I hope you guys enjoyed the build, and if you'd like to see more, let me know. I've got some more So You Wanna Play As concepts for PoE expats like me in mind, but also some of my own original builds or spins on builds that I haven't really seen from other Last Epoch content creators yet. It's a really fun game, and I'd love to create more content for it, so if you guys enjoyed the video, I'd be really happy. Till next time, travelers.